Hey, I'm Luke. I wrote and directed the film. And I'm John. I produced and VFX supervised. So this film is only four minutes long, and if we're going to do a commentary track, there's really only one way we can do it. Press the button and pause it. Yeah. So we're going to be pausing the film, we're going to be rewinding it, we're going to be seeing parts of it again, and we're going to be talking a lot about what it takes to make a independent monster movie. That is true. And uh, if you decide you just want to watch it without listening to us talk, click here or there, wherever the link ends up being. There. There. And it'll take you to, to the actual movie uninterrupted. Yeah. So, without further ado, like, let's get into the, the film and start talking about it. Play. <laughs> Ethan, our actor here, he came to us via Kimberly Browning, who's uh, one of my best friends and a longtime filmmaking collaborator of mine. And when I pitched her this idea, she was like, I know the perfect kid for you. And she was right. Yeah, he was great. We actually filmed at my former boss's house. I mean, she was my boss at the time, and I was terrified that we were going to break something. I was pretty sure we were going to get you fired. <laughs> that we were going to set our house on fire and you would not have a job ever again. Now, if you look directly over Ethan's shoulder, you'll see uh, a little knit toy there. It's a knit kraken that my sister Teal made. And I thought it would be a fun little Easter egg, a little bit of foreshadowing for what's to come later in the film. Ethan was supposed to be bouncing the ball here as he walked yeah. through. Yeah, Ethan was actually like running around the set, squeaking it at everybody. And it was bouncing so irregularly. like Because it's not like a basketball kind of thing. Yeah. It was more of a foam ball, yeah. so it didn't really respond as well, like consistently bounce. The important part of that moment isn't that he bounces the ball off his mom's leg, it's that he goes and he annoys his mom. Right. The ball bouncing is a visual gag, but the ball squeaking is an audio gag. And this film didn't have any dialogue in it. So the more audio gags and the more audio moments we could build into it would make the film better. So this is a, a, something we called as an audible. We just made the change right there on set, cut out a couple shots, changed the action, and in the process, made the film stronger. You had actually designed this film to not have dialogue for a reason. You wanted a film that was almost like an old school silent film because mm -hmm. it would be a more universal thing that wasn't dependent on English uh, as its primary delivery system of information so that it could play worldwide. I wanted something that had the universal themes of, of play and imagination and the idea of a dark and scary place, but then to flip those and have what would normally be the victim become the hero. If you continue playing here, we'll see Ydaibar has a fantastic reaction. Ydaibar Orozco, is that how you say it? That, I think that's how you say yeah. it, yeah. Uh, Ydaibar was great. Um, her name is very hard to pronounce. You can spell it, though. Uh, yeah, Y-D-A-I-B-E-R. I may or may not have just read that off the computer. <laughs> you probably read that. <laughs> oh, hey, there you go. That's my hand from a pickup day. He's got soft fingers. Got the touch, got the touch. The ball bouncing is actually a VFX shot, mm -hmm. fully digital. So the following shot is practical. We actually had a BB-8 style motorized ball that we used so we could actually stop it on cue. Instead, we went old school. We put down some sticky tape that you can't see on camera, and lo and behold, it catches the ball. There was one additional problem with the sticky tape, though. We left it on the floor, and crew and us, everyone was walking on it, and pretty much we we like smushed it into the, <laughs> the floor. Yeah. So when we wrapped, um, we couldn't get it up properly. And our poor production designer, Ty Whipple, who did a fantastic job on this movie. Yeah, thanks, was on Ty. his hands and knees. But I mean, I think even with his fingernails, like ended up pulling it off. It was amazing. It was a good learning lesson. We, we should have just yeah. pulled it up right away, but we rushed. Clean your sticky tape off, kids. This is actually John's hand again, but inside the tentacle. Yeah, we, we actually had a, a practical tentacle that was yay big, and you just stick your hand in it and swipe the ball. And, make <laughs> it move. Um, and that fit with what our mantra was, which was try to do as much practically mm -hmm. before augmenting with CGI. So there's a certain level of authenticity that comes from using an actual physical prop. Obviously, neither one of us is against using CG, but if for your close-ups you can use an actual physical model, the, the way that the light hits it and the weight that it carries on film 
really helps convince the audience that it's an actual thing so that when they see a wide shot that's CG, it feels more authentic. It's one of those things, too. It also gives us in post a great reference of what mm -hmm. it should look like, the way the light hits it, the way it reflects, the way shadows are being cast. Yeah. Uh, so that when we, when we go to create the digital version of it, we have a really strong idea mm -hmm. of what the actual thing looked like in the in the actual shot. So this right here is probably my favorite shot in the movie. It is the iconic shot for us. It ended up being the poster mm -hmm. for the film. I really like the sound design and the score in this section. It does a great job of helping to change the mood of the piece. So I want to just stop talking for a minute and let's just watch this without us yammering over it. I do want to give a shout out to uh, Nathaniel Smith, who's our composer. And Steve Romero, our sound designer. We shot this MOS, like there was no sound at all in the entire thing. And then Steve created the audio landscape that you hear here. As Ethan comes around, you can see that we have this wonderful fireplace that our production designer, Ty, actually built for us. It wasn't there in the space, so he yeah. built a practical thing. But obviously having a real life fire was <laughs> going to be problematic yeah. for many reasons for us. So what we ended up doing is uh, digitally inserting in the embers. Uh, in hindsight, we probably should have dropped some green screen uh, in between the grates. It would have made um, our post process yeah. a lot easier. <laughs> and by our, John means his, because well, I, I was like, John, we need embers in here. Like you'll see there's a, a tracking shot, which is a gorgeous tracking shot, but Ethan moves around a lot. He crosses in front of, or in between the slats, and so that means each one had to be like yeah, individually drawn. Yeah. yeah, so it was a lot of work. But it, I think it worked out perfectly for the shot. Yeah, I wanted to have like a creepy, like uh, home alone sort of scary furnace. So part of what we wanted to do narratively here in the basement is we wanted to set up a place that contrasted to the nice, happy, sunny upstairs of the house. So we wanted to make the basement as dark and scary as possible, but the basement didn't actually look like that in reality. We couldn't light it in the way that we actually, what you're seeing now, um, and it's a testament to Nico, he was very honest in saying like, listen, we don't have the space to light this properly because you're gonna catch it all in camera, mm -hmm. meaning we'll catch the light stands and the power cords, and we just didn't have any places to hide it. So we were able to have a conversation about it on the day and say, we can we can window this all in post, meaning we can overlight the shot, yeah. give ourselves lots of information, and then when we go to color correction in the DI, uh, we can create this look. Another visual effect in the scene, obviously, is the monster and the eyes. Man, this was a tough shot to get right, but luckily the guys over at Pike FX, Harry and Ben, did a fantastic job. I was really impressed with how they took the physical prop and they made the digital model out. I mean, there's probably a whole nother little behind the scenes piece we could do talking to them. Yeah, let's find out. So I always called this the monster vision shot in my shot list. I really like the build of the music here. I told Nathaniel that I wanted something in Jaws-esque, something that had that good like bum 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 sort of build as the monster is approaching our hero. So here we go again. This is tentacle shot, which is my favorite shot in the movie. Uh, it's all practical. We've got slime, we've got blood, none of it's digital, it's all real. And uh, one of the cool things about it is we had to douse the tentacle in KY to get that nice slimy thing. Yeah. We also had to douse our actor in slime. You know, one of the things about directing is being able to relate to your actors. So in order to give Ethan a safe place, I had the makeup artist also put KY jelly all over my face. And that helped Ethan get into the moment. Yeah, he definitely liked that you were, that you were also covered in KY. <laughs> so it was, it was a cool thing for him. But the real hero is this final shot. This pretty much makes or breaks the film because it does take us to that next level. We realize that he's himself the monster, yeah. really. And we did a test of mm -hmm. you 
um, click there. Yeah. <laughs> and this we're is, gonna get full screen yeah. here. And that's Luke with uh, the digital teeth, and that was something we did really quickly just to yeah. make sure. We had had a big discussion about whether or not it should be practical or mm -hmm. digital, um, and this time digital one. When John and I talked about it, we realized that where there was really only one shot where you saw the teeth. If it was something where you needed to see him speaking and you need to see him with the teeth throughout the film, it would have been worth the expense to build the actual prop that he could wear, the prosthetic that he could wear. But since it was only this final shot, we decided that it would be a better use of our talents and resources to make it digitally. Yeah. So that's our special extended extra long short film commentary on Time to Eat. I want to give a great big shout out and a thank you to Ediver and Ethan. It was really a joy to work with all of you. And thank you to our crew who uh, yes. knocked it out of the park for us. The truth is we couldn't have made this film without the hard work and talent of many people. Thank you very much. Yeah, to all thank you them. guys. And thank you for watching. Oh, and believe it or not, there's actually more behind the scenes material at our website, timetoeatfilm.com. See you guys on the next one. Thanks a lot.